from the SiliconANGLE Media office in Boston, Massachusetts. It's the Cube. Now, here's your host, Dave Vellante. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this special presentation. We're going to introduce you to a new kind of company. First, you might recall we've been reporting extensively on multi-cloud and the need to create consistent experiences across cloud at high performance. Now a key to that outcome is the ability to leave data in place where it belongs, not moving it around, and bringing a cloud-like experience to that data. We've talked about Kubernetes as a multi-cloud enabler, but it's an insufficient condition for success. Latency matters. In fact, it's critical and the ability to access data at high speeds, wherever that data lives, will we believe be a fundamental tenet of multi-cloud. Now today, I want to introduce you to a company called Vicinity, V-C-I-N-I-T-Y. The simplest way to think of this company is they turn wide area networks into a global LAN. And with me is Craig Hibbert to talk about this. He's the VP at Vicinity. Craig, good to see you again. Thanks a lot, thanks for having me today. It's good to be back. So when I first heard about this company, I said, well, no, you can't, that's breaking the law of physics. So first of all, tell me a little bit background about the company. Sure, yeah, absolutely. So about two decades ago, uh, this company was formerly known as Bay Microsystems. They were, they were asked to come up with a solution specific for the United States military. Um, and there was a couple of people involved in that, uh, that tender. Um, uh, fortunately for us, Bay Microsystems prevailed, and they've had their uh, solution in place with the US military for, for well over a decade, uh, approaching two decades. So that is the foundation, that is the infrastructure of, of where we originated. So did I get it right? I mean, kind of come to what you do, can you add some color to that? Yeah, yeah, I'll, uh, as, as much as I can, right? So based on who the uh, the, the main consumer is. So uh, we do some very creative things where we um, we take the benefits of TCP IP, which is the, the, the retransmit, the ability to uh, ensure the data arrives there in, in one piece, uh, but we take away all the bad things with it, things like dropping packets, typically, uh, WANs are, are lossy networks, and, and most people are accustomed to, to fiber channel networks, which of course, which are lossless. Right. And so what we've done is take the, the beauty of TCP IP, uh, but remove the hindrances to it, and that's how we get it to function uh, at the same speeds as a LAN over a WAN. So, but there's got to be more to it than that. I mean, it just sounds like magic, right? So you're able to leave data in place and mm -hmm. access it yep. at very low latency, very high speeds, so, you know, what's the secret sauce behind that? Is it, is it you know, architecture, patents, I mean? Yeah, you absolutely. Us? So we have uh, over 30 unique patents that contribute to that. We're not just doing those things that I just talked about before, there's a lot more. Uh, we're actually uh, shortening the typical OSI stack, the, the um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, moving through those layers, and using RDMA. Um, so a lot of companies use this today, obviously Infinidat uses it in between the nodes, uh, uh, Dell uses it, HP uses it. It's a very ubiquitous technology. Uh, but typically it has a very short span. It, it's designed for low latency, has a 21 foot uh, limitation. There's certain things you can do to get around that now. Um, so what we did in our earlier iterations is extend that uh, so you could go across the world but utilizing that inside a, a proprietary uh, a, a sort of L2 uh, a tunneling protocol allows you to reinstantiate those calls that happened on the local side and, and bring them up uh, at the other side of the world. So and presumably that sets up for Rocky. It does, road, right? yeah, and Rocky too, yeah, absolutely. So we, we, we use that, we use it in converged Ethernet. Um, we can do some magical things where we can go in InfiniBand and, and potentially come out Rocky at the other end. Uh, there's a lot of really good things that we do. Obviously, InfiniBand's expensive, uh, converged Ethernet's a lot more feasible uh, and a lot, lot, lot easier to adapt. Wait a minute, let me make sure I understand this. So you think InfiniBand, you're thinking you know, in a data center, sure. or, you know, proximate, and it's sure. talking synchronous yep. distances. Are you saying that you can extend that? We can, in but, fact. But, what, but, yeah. but extend it, not extending InfiniBand, but you're saying you can you translate it into Correct. Ethernet. Yeah. Yeah, we, we, we translate into, we have some proprietary uh, uh, mechanisms, obviously, that uh, that we hold the patents on, mm -hmm. but uh, in essence, that's exactly what we're doing. Yeah, we take, a, uh, in the earlier years, uh, InfiniBand and extend that to wherever it needed to be over any distance, and, and now we do it with converged. A add InfiniBand-like speeds. Yeah, yeah, so obviously you've got, the, we can't get around physics, so, I mean, for instance, between our um, Maryland office and our San Jose office, it's a, a 60 millisecond RTT, and we can't get beyond that, we can't cheat physics, but but what we can do is deliver a, sometimes a 20x payload inside that same um, RTT. So in essence, you could argue 
um, that were beating the speed of, of light by delivering a higher payload. Is, what's the trade-off? I mean, there's got to be something here. Uh, yeah, so it's, it, to today it's not, it's not ideal for every single situation. If you were to do a um, um, transactional LTP uh, a database at one side of the world to the other, it, it would, that would not be great for the solution. Talking big files. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so what we actually do, I mean, some, some great examples we have um, is seismic data. We have uh, some companies that are doing seismic uh, exploration, and it used to take a lot of time to bring that data back to shore, uh, copy it to a, a, a disk array, and then you know, copy it to multiple disk arrays across the world so people can analyze it. Um, in that particular use case, we bring that data back. We can even access it via satellite um, um, uh, for directly from the boats uh, that are doing the, uh, the surveys. And then we can have multiple people around the world looking at that sample live, and we do a demonstration for our customers that shows that. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's one great example of time to market uh, and getting ahead of your competition. What's the file system? underneath. Um, so we have a choice of different file systems. It's a parallel file system. We chose Spectrum Connect. It's a very ubiquitous file system. It's well known. It has uh, the, the, there is no other file system that has the uh, the hours of runtime that that has. Um, we obfuscate the complexities from the customers. We do all of the tuning, so it's a custom solution, um, and so they don't see it. But we do have some of the hyperscalers that want to use Luster and Gluster and BGFS and things like that, and we, we can accommodate those. So you offer choice, but the the preferred is is GP. PFS, is that the, right? the custom one we have, yeah, absolutely. If somebody wants to use another one, we have done that and, and can certainly have dialogues around it. Quick, talk about how this is different from competitors. I think of like guys like doing WAN acceleration. Sure. Sure, yeah, it's very different? different. So, WAN acceleration, regardless of who you are today, is predicated upon caching. Uh, substantial caching. And some of the problems with that are obviously once you turn on um, encryption, uh, that compression and those deduplication uh, or data reduction technologies um, are hampered in that caching. Um, based on who our primary customer was, we're handed encrypted data from them and we re encrypt it as well. So we have double layers of encrypted data and that does not affect our performance. So, massive underlying uh, technological differences that allow you to adapt to the modern world with encrypted data. So we've been talking, as I said in the, in the intro, a lot about multi-cloud. Mm -hmm. can, you, can you tell us kind of where do you fit in? For, first of all, how do you see that evolving? Sure. Um, and where do you guys fit in? Sure, so I actually read, it's actually very serendipitous. I read your article before we had a dialogue okay. last yeah. week, and you know, there was a good article talking about the complexities around uh, uh, multi-cloud. And I think, you know, you look at Google, it, it's got some refactoring involved in it. Uh, they're all great approaches. We think the best way to deal with multi-cloud today is to hold your data yourself and bring those services that you want to it. And, and before we came along, you couldn't do that. Um, uh, so, so think now a, a movie studio. We, we, we have a, a, a company in California um, that needs people working on video editing across the world. And typically they would proliferate multiple copies out to storage in India and in China and Australia. And not only is that costly, but it's incredibly time consuming. And in one of those instances, um, it opens up security holes and the movies were getting hacked and stolen, and of course that's billions of dollars worth of damage to, to any movie company. So by having one set of security tenants um, in, your, in your physical place, you can now bring anybody you want to consume that data. Bring them all together, bid you know, GCP, AWS, Azure for the compute, and you maintain your data. And that segues well into uh, things like GDPR and things like that where um, the data isn't moving, so you're not affected by those rules and regulations. The data stays in one place. So it's, it, we, we think it's a huge advantage. So has that helped you get some business? I mean, the fact that you don't have to move data and you can keep it in, in place, it, it, maybe it, you can give us an example. Yeah, it absolutely does. I mean, if you think of uh, companies like uh, pharmaceutical companies that have a lot of data to process, whether it's electron mic microscopic data, nano tissue samples, mm -hmm. um, they need heavy iron to do that. We're talking craze. Um, so we can facilitate the ability to rent out uh, supercomputers um, uh, and the security company at the farmers is happy to do that because it's not leaving the four walls, uh, present the data and run it live because we're getting land speeds, right? We're giving you land speed performance over the WAN. So it's, it's, it's possible, we've actually done it, for them to do that, craze make money by renting, the farmers are happy because they can't afford craze. It's a great way to accelerate time to market and in that case, um, they're making drugs specific for your 
your genome, specific for your body tissue. Uh, so the efficacy of the drugs is greatly improved as well. I want to ask you, you and I have been, we know the storage business, uh, primary storage right now is, a, I've said it's a knife fight. Yeah. And uh, it's, a cloud is eating away at it. Uh, flash was injected and gave people a lot of headroom, so they're not buying spindles for performance anymore. But, but data protection and backup and, and data management is really taking off. Do you guys fit in there? Is, 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 are there use cases for you, you there? When you think of companies like Cohesity and Rubrik and, and many others that are, mm -hmm. the, the cloud seems to be a tailwind for them. Is it a tailwind for you? I think so, and I think you just brought up a great point. Um, if you look at, and again, another one of your articles, I'm giving you some, some, yeah, some free you. kudos here. I wonder if I get any discount. <laughs> um, the article you wrote, I thought was excellent about um, how data has changed. It's not so much about the primary data now, it's about uh, the backup data. And what Rubrik and Cohesity especially have done is bring value to that data. And they've elevated it up the stack for analytics and AI and made available to DevOps, and that's brilliant. But today, they're confined to within the four walls of that company. What Vicinity mm. can do for those companies is come along and make that data available anywhere in the world at any time. So if they've got uh, uh, different countries that they're trying to sell into that may have different backup types or different data, they can access this and model the data and see how, it, how it's relevant to their specific industry, right? As we say, our zeros and ones are different than your zeros and ones. So, so it's a massive expansion. It, take that richness that they've created and extrapolate that globally, and that's what vicinity brings to the table. You know, we, in the days of big data, we used to look at uh, high-performance computing as an example, going more into commercial. That's, that's clearly happened, um, but mainstream is still VMware. Is there mm -hmm. a VMware play for you guys or opportunity? Great question, great question. Re in, in Q1 of this year, so so January, end of January 2020, um, typically in the intro we talked about how we were born on ASICs, uh, which is incredibly expensive and, and, and limited, you get one go at it, and then we moved to FPGAs. We actually wrote a lot of libraries that took the FPGAs into a VMware instance. And so what we're doing now with our customers is when we go in and present, they say, there's no way you can do this, and we show them the demo. When we actually leave, they can log in, uh, download two VMware instances, put one in, in the East Coast, one on the West Coast, or with one of my customers we have now, one on the East Coast, one in London, download the VM and see the improvement that we can get over their dedicated lines or even the internet by using the VM. In fact, we did that uh, in, a, in a test with AWS last week and got a 90% improvement just using the VM. So when you're out talking to customers, what's the, you know, what's the, the situation that you're looking for? Mm -hmm. the, the problem that comes up that you say, boom, that's vicinity. Maybe you could sure, no, it's a good question. Color there. So I think a lot of that is people looking to use multi-cloud, right? That aren't mm -hmm. sure which way they want to go or how they want to do it. And for other companies that can't move the data, there's a lot of companies that either went to the cloud and came back, um, or cannot go to the cloud because of the sensitivity of the data. So, uh, and also things like the, the seismic exploration, right? There is no cloud solution um, that, that makes that expedient enough to consume it as it's been developed. And so anybody that needs movie editing, uh, large file transfer, um, DR, you know, if you're moving a lot of files from one location to another, we can't get involved in storage replication, but if it's a file share, um, we can do that. And one of the great things we do is if you have uh, SIFs or NFS shares today, we can consume those shares with the, with the spectrum scale, the GPFS under the cover, and make that appear anywhere else in the world. And we do that through our proprietary uh, technology, of course. So uh, now remote offices can collapse a lot of the infrastructure they have and consume uh, the resources from the main data center because we can reach right back in at land speeds. They just become an extension of the land, no different than me plugging the laptop into a, an ethernet port. And, and, you, and you pay a penalty on first byte. We do. But it, it's almost, uh, transparent because yeah. of the way TCP IP works, very mm -hmm. chatty. Yep, know. it is, so we, we drop all that, and that, that's a great question. An analogy we use in-house is you turn on a garden hose, and it takes a few seconds for that garden hose to fill, uh, but with us, that water stream is constant, and it's constantly outputting water. With TCP IP, it'd be stop, start, stop, start, stop, start, and if you have to start doing retransmit, which is a, a regular occurrence of TCP IP, that entire capacity of that garden hose will be dropped, and then refilled, and this is where our advantage is, the ability to keep that full and, and, and keep serving data. And that, what you just described, makes people really think twice about multi-cloud, and essentially they want to put the right workload in the right place and kind of leave it there. And, and, and essentially, it's like the old mini-computer days, they're creating you know, silos 
uh, you're helping sort of bridge those. We are, that, and that is the plan. And so, um, you know, we have B2B, we have B2C. I mean, if you sit and think about the possibilities, I mean, it could end up on every one of these, mm -hmm. right? This software, uh, you know, do we tackle every wireless point? This is this is some of the things that we can do. You're in an airport, do we put vicinity on there to take the, the regular TCVIP and send the communication, uh, you know, uh, through, through our proprietary uh, network or our proprietary configuration? So there's a lot of things that we can do. We can we can affect everybody, and that is that is the goal. So do I buy hardware from you, or software, or both? Um, that's a, another great question. So if you are in a data center, and the the analogy I just gave before about uh, being a, a, a big data center, you would use a piece of hardware that's got accelerant in it, um, and then the remote office could use a smaller piece of hardware or just the VM. Uh, with the movie company example I gave you earlier, India and Australia is editing live files uh, on the west coast of the United States of America just using the VM. Mm. Um, so it depends. What we come in is we look at your needs, and we, we don't oversell you. We try and sell you the correct uh, solution, and that typically is a combination of some hardware in the main data center and some software at the others. So I've said, you know, multi-cloud in many ways creates more problems today than it solves. You guys are really in there uh, attacking that. Multi-cloud is a reality. It's, it's happening. You know, I said historically it's been a symptom of multi-vendor, but now it's becoming increasingly a strategy, and I think, frankly, I think companies like yours are critical in the ecosystem to really you know, drive that transformation for organizations, so congratulations. Thank you, thank thanks you, we hope so, and I'm sure we'll be seeing more of you in, uh, in, in the future. Excellent, well, thanks for coming in, Craig, and we'll talk to you soon. Thank and you. thank you for watching, everybody. This is Dave Vellante for theCUBE, and we'll see you next time.